really important actually. A lot of the um, kind of the good thing about a lot of the APRA stuff that we receive is it's part of that income that you, um, I suppose to a degree you don't rely on but it's a massive boost when it comes through because you don't have that date necessarily set in your cal calendar as to when life performance or radio royalties are put through. But I mean we would make probably a larger portion of our APRA income just through our life performance returns that we do. And so people don't realise how important they are in particular and they're so piss easy to do. It's just a case of you go on the website, you type in the song and then you type in, you can type in how many times you've performed that song in the last couple of months or in my case year, as I shouldn't be doing. Okay, so splits for co-writing. This is one of those things that's changed a little bit over the period of the band. So when we initially formed as a band, um, we really wanted it to be an even split as far as what the writing credits were going to be. So 25, 25, 25, 25 for four of us. As that sort of went on, I suppose there was more singular involvement with the tracks and there was probably more singular involvement in the tracks back then, but we were like, yeah, band of brothers type of thing. <laughs> um, we had a couple of drummers leave in between the EP and the album. We had one, one drummer leave in that time. And when you have someone leave a group or something like that, A, you may not expect it, but B, it also makes you realise that that sort of band of brothers mentality may not last forever, and you're not going to want to be bitter about the fact that you wrote that entire song and everyone else has got an even share of that particular track. So for Counting Spins, um, we approached it a little bit more on who wrote the particular song. So I think we did it. We're, we're always pretty involved with each other's songwriting. It's never really like, this is exactly how the song goes, <coughs> and that's that. Um, so we kind of did it like the main person that wrote the song got half the percentage of the track, and then the, there was either three or um, two or three of us that wrote the additional part of the song, and then that would just be divvied up as to per what someone else did. And we also did a little printout of that and signed off the printout. Just because, I mean, some people get fueled with emotions later on down the track. You never know what might happen. Someone might sleep with someone's girlfriend or something like that. <laughs> you know, someone might throw together a demo of three quarters of the song themselves. Yeah. And so even if you, if you wanted to argue it, you could go back and say, look, this is the first thing that I sent. How much did it actually deviate from that particular thing? But again, we're not out to screw one another over. You know, we're, we're all good friends and the last thing that I would want was a song that I had heavily written mm. for them to just be completely cut out of the picture of it because you never know what song is going to go massive. Ah, uh, that stage is after we've recorded it. Yeah, because you don't know if it, I mean for us, we don't know if it's going to change very much. So you, you never know, someone might come up with the most killer idea when you're recording it that changes the song in terms of being alright to being the greatest song ever. <laughs> um, which has happened to all of our songs in the writing process. <laughs> um, yeah, so we always do it afterwards. Not after it's the record gets released, it's in between recording it and releasing the record, I suppose is important to say. Because mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to do it after a song got massive. For us, we aren't as emotionally involved, I suppose, with our lyric writing. I mean, not saying that we don't have emotional connections to the lyrics or whatever, but I think the way that we used to look at it was we would go, we would sort of look at the parts of the song that we thought were um, pivotal. And that went vocal melody being one, chords, so backing music being the other one, and lyrics being the other one. So we had those three facets to it. And so when we were looking at a song that was three or four of us that we put together, it was a case of um, you, you, you'd almost write down whose name did what. You know, lyrics was Dave and Steve, and music was just Tristan, and you know, the vocal melody was just Steve on its own. And it sort of helps you to 
figure out those initial vague percentages. But we always say when, in the odd times we've had those meetings about the particular percentages of the track, it's never like, this is my idea of the percentage, take it and accept it. It's always like, this is the rough thing that I think it might be. It's always the organised one that gets the rough list, that being me. So I put the rough list out there and we talk about it. And usually what ends up happening is we'll just tick off every song and there'll be three of them that we kind of talk about and say, cool, let's jiggle this a little bit that way and that way. But this was the thing that we learned with Jimmy, is you imagine if you come to a rehearsal with great lyrics written down, but you haven't had any concept of the syllables that are within those lyrics or whatever. And um, so what ends up happening is the melody that the vocalist is singing is actually stuck in a tunnel of whatever the words that you've written down. You are limited to how you sing that particular track, a particular line of a song, because you've got X amount of syllables, which means you've got X amount of melody, mm -hmm. notes, or whatever. And so we work on that melody, and then there'll be the odd time where um, the lyrics that you write, you'll write a particularly important line, and then you'll work on fitting that line in within the melody that's there. Mm -hmm. and sometimes it takes a bit of rejigging. But that melody coming first, I think if I could give anyone here any form of advice, I think that is yeah. probably the strongest thing that we learned. Because what is the thing that people sing? It's the melody, and do people know the words before they know the melody? They don't. They know the melody first. Yeah. And you know, that's where you get misheard lyrics, because people sing along to the song, and they may not necessarily know exactly what is said unless they love the song to death. And um, it's the melody that kind of is shining through the entire time. That's, that, that's a good question. Um, yeah. It's like, I, I think, yeah, it's one that you laugh about, but I think if you imagine like Crazy Yes Dumb No by the Mint Chicks, without that beat, that is a massive part of that song. And so it all depends on how prominent a particular beat is in the track. There's one song that we did, I think we arranged for a little portion of the songwriting to go to the drummer, because our initial drum beat was just sort of like, it was just a really straight one, and he changed it to this really crazy sort of Philly tambourine sort of beat. And that actually it made a massive difference to the feel of the song. And so that's the case where we sort of looked at it and went, this is an important part of the track. But for us, a lot of the demos that we've done have actually got a vague idea of programmed drums or a vague idea of looped drums, or one of us have played the drums on top of them. And so the actual recording of the drums and the feel of it doesn't actually differ hugely. But I think in our case, if the feel differs massively from the demo, then that's a good time to actually look at it. Because it, if that's what you end up recording, then it's obviously improved what was originally there. I think, yeah, for us, that's a good question actually. Like, even just entirely on a, a personal level, getting, you know, a second album completed is a huge milestone. You've got to look at certain milestones, I think, in music, not based off, you know, how many people buy a record or how many people come to shows or whatever. You have to have those own personal satisfactions and that's what helps you keep afloat and keep motivated to do what you're doing. Because if you're happy with the record that you've done and no one listens to it, who cares? You know, it's still a record that you think is a good record and whatnot. And so for us, each record has had its, you know, has had success in a different way, I suppose. Um, the first EP kind of really appealed to the alternative crowd and then the first album that we ended up doing sort of got a really clean cut production to it and in turn got a lot more radio play, but it ended up sort of jibbing our previous crowd that we had. And then this album has sort of flipped it back a little bit more and more of the alternative crowd are getting back into it. Um, and so the goals that we have for this particular record and for the next kind of couple of years is uh, working on the, basically the Australian release for the record. Because where we sit as a band, we don't sit comfortably on a rock radio station 
or on a pop radio station or on an indie radio station kind of fall in between all three of those. So it means that um, this record's really getting pitched to the Triple J sort of radio station, which actually sit kind of comfortably within those three. Right. Um, and fortunately, the, the press and everything we've had from the record over here, so it hasn't sold as well as the last one, but the press that we've had has been really phenomenal, and that in turn has helped, you know, push the boat out in Australia, and we've had a lot of contact with the industry over here right. from that. So you can kind of lose success one way and gain it in another way. It's just the biggest thing is to do what you want to do. Because we could have screwed ourselves over with this record, being that our previous audience from the first one was like a mainstream radio audience. But we just wanted to do what we wanted to do and uh, we kind of said screw up to the consequences whether no one listened to it, but it's panned out well for us. We are lucky, I think, that we don't even massively get it because there are three of us. And so it means that if someone's going through a period of writer's block, then someone else might be okay. It would take three of us to all have writer's block at the same time. But I think in the times that I might have personally had writer's block, it's a case of sometimes changing your process to how you write a song um, can just help rejig you. So it could be a case of instead of trying to create a vocal melody first, you, excuse me, then you might create a drum loop and that drum loop will help, help sort of inspire some form of backing key for a song and then you can create a melody along those lines. Mm. Now when I say melody first as well actually, this is probably worth pointing out, um, that doesn't mean we don't write the underlying music first every time. What it means is that the melody comes before the lyrics and sometimes the melody is just the standalone thing that you base that particular track from. So it's like a good example of that is we were talking with Joel uh, Little when he did My House by Kids of 88 and that was entirely done off a phone recording mm -hmm. of just that vocal melody. And then they took it in one afternoon and put all the backing chords mm -hmm. behind that to sort of throw it together. But yeah, I, t I just think if you relied on the same process every single time, then that's an easy way of going stale, I suppose. So changing it up, you know, even for me, like I might think about writing lyrics first in a situation if I got really stuck in, you know, just to try and get me doing something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose. Because US costs way more flighty. Right. That would be the big part. Aussies a lot closer, it's a lot bigger, and just travelling and dealing with them is a lot easier. You've got time difference in, in the States. I think, you know, I know a lot of bands that have ended up, ended up sort of spewing a lot of money into doing something over in the UK or the US and it's ended up, you know, being a fruitless kind of thing. Something like South by Southwest or CMJ, those things you hear about bands doing all the time and, um, you know, the cost of getting maybe five people over to the States and back. Right. You hear about costs of sort of upwards of 40 grand to get a band to and from CMJ or South by Southwest. And a lot of Kiwi bands you'll talk to after they've done it have got nothing that has shown from South by or CMJ. You will have those examples that do have them, but it's a lot of money to throw mm. at something like that. I mean, even for us, we did Big Sound this year, and I think the total costs of getting the band to and from Australia and Back was about 15 grand, and that's just Aussie. So, you know, it's, it's just so much bigger and so much more expensive for their field that that's why we particularly have chosen to do it here. And we feel like that's got the fitted market for <coughs> who might actually listen to our album, hopefully. Yes, we do. Yep. Yeah. That's a good one, actually. Um, don't screw the band over. <laughs> Um, one of the things that it says in the agreement is everyone must do a minimum of X amount of hours of work per week towards the band. And that's not actually a thing that we stick to, but it's a case that we have that in the contract. If someone just decides to sit on their hands and do nothing for six months, 
then we have that agreement to bounce back to and say, look, you haven't done anything, you're not pulling your weight. Um, it says stuff like, uh, if you're going to leave the band, then you need to give 12 weeks notice or something along those lines so that, you know, the, <coughs> say if you've got a tour coming up, you've, if the tour is very recent when they're going to leave the band, then they've got obligations to continue through that tour or it also gives us time if there's no tour to replace the member by the time that the next dates carry on through. It's a good thing to have. It's just, I think you can get kind of blanket ones probably from New Zealand Music Commission and stuff like that. Ours was drawn up by a lawyer, but it's just for the standard thing. It goes back to that thing that I was talking about earlier about you can assume that everyone you're working with is your best bud and will never screw you over, but you just never know. So you're better to have that sort of stuff because it just makes the whole thing a lot more easy breathing when that happens, if it happens. No, actually, so what we did, first one was done really live uh, at the lab in Auckland and really fast and sort of chipped that out pretty quickly. And we loved the way that that particular EP worked. And then the first album was one of those ones that had a lot of money spent on it. And we are only at the point now where we've just managed to pay that particular record off. And then the second album was basically completely paid off at the time and we went back to the initial process of really wanting to capture the live sound of the band. Now, to, and I think from from here on, there's no way that we would ever put in as much money as we put in for the first record because the more money you put in, the more money you have to get as a return to justify the cost that you're spending on that particular record. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't, you know, nowadays it doesn't give you anything better you can get great sounding records for far cheaper. There's a group that I know of that have spent 120 grand or something on an album. And a, a lot of the talk about that is basically like, everyone's sort of saying, well, we could do like 10 albums out of that amount of money. You're, you're not gonna get a hell of a lot better result from 120 grand or 100 grand or whatever it is to even at a huge cost of like 30 grand here in New Zealand. You could compare those two records and find that, you know. Uh, the new one, we didn't really do a hell of a lot of road testing, so we're just sort of getting settled on the track. Um, the tracks are, you know, we know what we're doing with them now, but for the first initial starting point, they're, they're a little bit shaky. It's, I think it's a really good thing to do, but I don't, we, we, we recorded the second album six months after we'd done the first one, so there just wasn't much time to um, really road test the songs in between.